Good morning. Dobro jutro. Buenos dias. Welcome to Anthem Church. My name is Natalie Rudnev. I first came through this church in September of 2018. Shortly thereafter, I de- made a public declaration of my walk in Christ in February of 2019. And ever since then, I have been growing and functioning within this wonderful body of Christ. I now, today, get to teach fourth to sixth graders about the perfect character of God, and it's wonderful. (laughs) I get very satisfied and filled with it. If everyone can now, um, in the honor of God's word, stand up, rise up to your feet, please. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please stay standing for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this afternoon. We ask in Jesus' name, would you cause us to hear your word, not just with our ears, but with our hearts? Would you um, cause us to submit, believe on your word, and would it change us, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. You guys could take a seat. God bless you. Uh, If you are new or visiting us for the first time, my name is Alex. I get to serve as one of the elders here at the church. And um, truly, it's a blessing for us to be able to host you. Uh, I'm not sure if, you, if it's your first time, uh, most likely you missed last week's service. Uh, last week was very special for us. It was the Super Bowl of Christianity, Easter, amen? It was Easter, and, uh, and it, was, it was amazing. Our church uh, baptized four uh, disciples of Jesus, and so that was cool at, at our a.m. service, 8 o'clock service. For the first time ever, we had three services, 8 a.m., 9.45 Eleven thirty, um, we saw uh, we hosted over seven hundred visitors, seven hundred attenders um, at our three services. That was really, really something to see in this space. Um, it is possible. And then also, we had a really good time outside. We had taco truck, uh, coffee car, cotton candy for the kids. I mean, all kinds of good stuff. It was truly, truly special. Um, the, the other reason why it was special is because we wrapped up our 28-week series through the Gospel of Mark, right? Who, who was part of uh, m- most of that? Three quarters of that series you were here. All right, three of you guys. God bless you. Um, <clears throat> And if you guys were here last week, you know that we, we ended on a very high note, very high note, right? This is the most important fact in all of history, past, present, and future, and, and that is uh, Jesus Christ is no longer dead, right, in the tomb. He is alive. He has been risen by God the Father. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, right? There's this triune effort uh, to uh, revive, not revive, but uh, uh, resurrect Jesus Christ. And so that was awesome. And um, what we saw was there was the witnesses, the eyewitnesses that showed up to the tomb were the three women. And what was their response when the angel told them that Jesus Christ is no longer dead but risen? What was their response? 
I mean, it was amazing. They had a, a, they had a, 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 the, the appropriate response to the risen, risen Christ. And here's, here's where we see it, Mark chapter 16, verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment has seized them. I mean, they were possessed by trembling and astonishment. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, right? This word afraid is they were bewildered. They were awestruck. They're running back to the disciples. They're not going to stop. They're not going to veer off. Uh, they're not going to take any breaks. I mean, these guys are, are sprinting back because they are filled with bewilderment. Jesus is no longer dead. He's not resuscitated. He is alive. He's made new. He will never die again. I mean, this is amazing. Why? Because if Jesus has been raised from the dead, then everything that Jesus said is true. Everything that Jesus said for 28 weeks is true, and it is trustworthy, and we could submit to it, and we could live according to it. There is a blueprint for life, for righteousness, for fulfillment. Why? Because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, a week after the resurrection, Mark leaves us with this suspense, this like loose end ending. Did they really not tell anyone about the risen Christ? Are they so over, overcome with bewilderment that they just did not tell anybody? I mean, they kept silent for 2,000 years. No, we're here. Come on, people. We got Anthem Church because they spoke up, right? The, uh, they went and they told the disciples. They began to just tell everybody that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. We know that Jesus began to reveal himself to the other disciples at one point, to 500 uh, uh, of his followers. Jesus was, uh, was visibly uh, experienced by, by his followers. And the gospel began to spread. The, the Pharisees, the opposers of Jesus, the ones that crucified him, right? Here's how they did damage control. They met with the guards and they said, listen, we'll pay you big, big money. We'll pay you more than we paid Judas, right? And uh, here's all you have to do. Tell, uh, spread a lie that Jesus has not been raised from the dead, but rather the disciples came at night and stole his body. And so the, the, the Pharisees, they believe this, uh, they spread the, the, the sorry, the, the, the guards spread this lie. The rest of the Pharisees believed it. Uh, uh, many people believed it. But, but, but the disciples of Jesus began, uh, continued spreading the true news about Jesus Christ, the true reality. And so there became this tension between the, the followers of the way, that's what they called them, and the Pharisees. The Pharisees began to pay, uh, persecute the, the Christians. Why? Because the way they saw it is that these Christians, the followers of the way, are perverting the true undefiled religion. They're perverting the Judaic uh, uh, belief system, right? They're, they're perverting it. And so they try to, they try to uh, preserve it. Specifically, there was this one man, uh, a young, young leader, uh, a young Pharisee by the name of Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, he was so zealot for the purity of the family of God, the purity of the, uh, of the Judaic uh, faith, right, the, the, the Jewish religion, that he would persecute the Christians. He would find out where they live, right? They, 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 they did the, uh, the trace tracking, right? We have tracking these days. They did, they did the, the, hey, where were you? Who said it? Where do they live? They would show up to your house and drag you out of the house in front of everyone, and they would, uh, they would get you to uh, recant your faith, or you would get stoned. You would get stoned. And actually, uh, the first martyr, the first uh, follower of the way of Jesus by the name of Stephen, right, he was stoned at the feet of this young, zealot, uh, zealous Pharisee by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was responsible for his stoning, the first disciple of Jesus. I mean, this guy was legit. He was not messing around. And let me tell you something. He was authentic. He was convinced that these guys were perverting the true and only faith. He was authentic, and he was so determined. He was so determined to stop this heresy, to stop this new movement that he was on his way to Damascus with, with, these, uh, uh, with these warrants for arrest for all these different uh, followers of the way. And on his way to Damascus, the Bible says that he encounters the risen Christ. There is this light that's shining, and he says, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Knowing the Torah, knowing whenever a shining light shows up, it's either God or a messenger of God. And it says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus responds, uh, Jesus responds, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am the risen Christ. 
I am the risen. You are persecuting me. You're, as you're killing Stephen, as you're dragging these people out of their homes, you're actually dragging Yahweh. You're dragging God. You're, you're stoning. You're killing God. And so what happens to Paul when he realizes that Jesus is not dead but actually alive? He has been risen from the dead. What does he do? Does he debate Jesus? No. He is filled with awe. He is filled with bewilderment. He is filled with this fear, right? He's filled with this fear, this reverence towards God. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of wisdom. If you need perspective for life, if you want to know what the, what the reason for your existence is, what the reason for life is, you need to have the fear of the Lord. You need to experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You need to be moved. You need to be gripped by the, by the resurrection. If you have not experienced the resurrection, you will not have wisdom in life because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Paul is so filled with this with this awe and reverence, this fear of the Lord, do you know what he starts doing? You know what his response is? The same response these women had. Here's, we pick up here in Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Immediately, that's the same word Mark was using in 28 uh, weeks. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem for those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Listen to this response. This is how we all ought to respond to the revelation of the risen Christ. Paul, he doesn't turn around and, and, and go back to Jerusalem. He goes back to, he continues going to Damascus where he was going to file warrants against the arrest of these followers of the way. He shows up to the synagogue that is approving these arrests, that are approving these uh, 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 capital punishments. He goes to them and he says, guys, I was wrong. I was wrong. This Jesus that, that, that was risen from the dead, we, that we thought was heresy, that we thought was a lie. No, no. I met him on the road to here. Believe on him. He's the Messiah we've been waiting for. And the Bible says that they are astonished. At what? At the resurrection? No. They're astonished at Paul. Paul, what are you, stupid? What's wrong with you? You too are uh, believing? You too got bamboozled? Paul, pull yourself together, man. You're on the fast track to promotion. Don't quit on us now, Paul. Come on, what are you doing, man? Get in line, Paul. And he says, no, the Bible says he grew in strength. Instead of cowarding, instead of capitulating to his, to his, uh, to his uh, leadership, right? No, no, he grows in strength, and he begins to convince him, no, no, no. This is Jesus Christ that we've been waiting for. We killed him, but God vindicated him from death. This is powerful. This is what the gospel does. And how many of us responded to the resurrection of Christ the way Paul did? Just a 180 degree change, day and night. This is amazing. Did Paul stop there? No. Paul did not stop there. Paul later joins the original disciples. They're kind of standoffish. They're afraid of him. Dude, uh, uh, we got to verify you. We got to make sure you got the blue check mark, right? Uh, we don't know if you're, uh, you're just kind of trying to set us up, right? And so they bring him in, and he starts to spend time with these disciples, and he's praying, and he's reading the word, and they're looking back at the Torah, and man, they're dreaming about what it could look like if the kingdom of God is ushered into not just the, uh, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. And here's, we also pick up uh, chapter 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, who said? The Holy Spirit, God said, set apart for me. Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Friends, we are set apart for God. Holy Spirit sets us apart for himself, for his work, not for my work, not for the work of the church, but for the work of God. If you're serving in this church, you're serving God. You have been called by God, not by a senior pastor, not by a leadership team. You've been called by God, set apart for his work, amen? Amen. And after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them, and they sent them off. They said, Paul, it's time for you to become the first disciple to the Gentiles. Come on, this is amazing. Paul, the fruition of the gospel is going to happen through, uh, through the uh, calling that God has called you to. 
And so Paul, he sets off on his first journey uh, to the Gentiles. This is, this is amazing. The, the gospel, uh, the, the access to the one true God is now expanding to the Gentile nations. We find this in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And so they're on this two-year uh, journey, and they're uh, traveling through the southern part of Galatia, this region. And we'll, we, we, there's these four cities that are named uh, in these two chapters, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. What are they doing there? They're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And not just proclaiming, they're not just preaching out in the, the, the streets, but they're planting churches. I mean, these guys are, they're not just a one and done, right? No, no, hey, let's meet together. The Bible says they would meet daily. They would break bread. They would introduce them into, they're making disciples. They're establishing churches. Are we doing that? Are we establishing churches after experiencing the resurrection of Christ? Are we proclaiming the gospel? Paul is proclaiming and establishing churches with Barnabas. This was, this was a, new, a, a new day, a new season for history. The Gentiles were now getting access to the one true God. They were joining the family of, 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 of Yahweh, becoming sons and daughters. The pagan Gentiles were forsaking their gods, and they were committing to the way they were becoming disciples. This is recorded all through Acts, 3,000, 5,000 being saved. All over, people are committing, responding to the gospel. But despite Paul's success, he did experience hardship. He did experience some uh, resistance from, from people and, and really from both groups. Listen to Paul's strategy of, of proclaiming the gospel. The first thing that Paul would do whenever he would enter into a city, he would go first to the synagogue. He would go first to the, uh, to the uh, Judaic uh, 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 people the people that believed in the Yahweh, the people that practiced the Torah, the people that practiced circumcision, practiced uh, uh, the, the food laws, the people that were uh, waiting on God, right? They were waiting for a Messiah. And so Paul, right, common sense, hey, I'm going to go to the people that are waiting for the Messiah. And so under the impression that they're going to respond with awe and reverence and excitement, right, bewilderment, what happened? Some responded, some believed, others resisted. Hey, you knock it off with that kind of stuff, man. No. We heard that the disciples stole his body. Right? This guy was a heretic. We don't believe in him. And so Paul would wipe off the dust off his shoes and he would go out into the public squares, right? Equal opportunity. He began to preach to, to, to all the different Gentiles. He would begin to proclaim, listen, you guys are all on a spiritual journey, right? All of you guys are looking for fulfillment. All of you guys are looking for purpose in life. I have found it. It is Jesus Christ. He is. He is the purpose. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way. That's what he preached. The Bible says that some believed, some didn't. Some believed and some didn't. And so what's interesting is uh, some believed, some did, didn't from both, both groups, right? From the Jews and from the Gentiles. But the opposition really came from the Jews, because they were preserving their faith. I mean, these guys were working hard to, to get their approval from God. And so what they did is, uh, as Paul would move on to the next city, they would, they would kind of, they would trace his trail, right? They would trace his tracks, and they would show up to the church. Hey, was Paul here? We heard Paul was here. Hey, the message that Paul's preaching, it's ludicrous. Man, that thing is sketchy. Don't believe in it. Jesus' body uh, was stolen. He's not alive. Don't believe it. And so uh, the Bible says that they would poison the minds of the people from one city to another. Finally, they catch up to Paul and Lystra. We pick up here in Acts chapter 14. But Jews came from Antioch and, and, and Iconium. Having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gather, gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. On the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to the city and, uh, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, uh, strengthening, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. What's happening? 
these, these, these opposers, they're, they're not just against this theology, they're against this man, and they're willing to kill him, and they thought they did. They persuaded the crowds, they, they stoned him, they dragged him out to die. And the disciples came, and, and Paul just popped up right up on his feet. And what does Paul do? Does he go back to Jerusalem? Does he, does he pack up his bags? Does he close shop? No. He goes back into the city where they stoned him. He gets fixed up real quick, pops a few Advils, moves on to Derby. Why? Because the gospel must be preached. Jesus is not dead. He is risen. Come on, the gospel has gripped Paul. He has changed Paul. There's nothing that can stop him. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what the gospel should do. Come on, are you moved by the gospel the way Paul was moved by the gospel? Are we? When was the last time we got stoned? When was the last time we got unfollowed for preaching the gospel? When was the last time we got fired from our jobs for preaching the gospel? When was the last time we got dismissed from a social club for preaching and standing and living and demonstrating the gospel? Paul did. He did. And so I want to just address the tone of the way he starts off this letter. We're going back to the letter. That's just an intro for you guys. How, 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 <laughs> what's the tone of this letter? Well, here's the tone. By the end of his ministry, he's not quite done. It's a two-year journey. By the end, I mean, this guy, he's going back and forth. He can't keep up. By the end of of, of his mission trip, his first mission trip, he gets word that some believers have already deserted the gospel that Paul preached. And we, we, read, we, read, we read the opening Galatians and we just, we just kind of, we just brush over it as if it's no big deal, as, as if though Paul is just having a bad day. No, no, Paul has the reaction that we're all supposed to have. He's astonished. I can't believe it. I would scream, but I can't. I can't believe it. He did that. He did a frantic screaming, pulling his hair. I cannot believe what you guys are doing, deserting the faith deserting the gospel. I died. I, was, I got stoned. And I still got up and I kept preaching. I went against persecution. Nothing stopped me. That was a display. That was me showing you that the gospel is worth it and you still went back to the old ways? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Can't believe it. That, that's his tone. That's it. He starts off his life. All the other letters, he writes 13 letters in the New Testament. It's all, brothers and sisters, hope you guys are doing well. Love you guys. Miss you guys. Can't wait to see you guys. Hey, do this and do that. Hey, forgive that guy. I can't believe it. That's how he starts his first letter. This one was uh, believed to be his first letter. I just can't believe it. Are you guys kidding me? Is this true? He's astonished. We, we, we get the same reaction, the same response from the first exodus. Remember, this is the second exodus. This is the same deliverance from sin, same deliverance from, uh, from our old ways to a new way. The, the uh, Jesus movement is the second ex. The first exodus was Moses coming to Egypt, right? Through the ten plagues, finally Pharaoh lets them go. Through the parting of the sea, through the cloud and the fire, the people are liberated from the, 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 the stronghold of Egypt, right? Then Moses goes up to the mountain. Man, God, Moses just feels called. He's, he's, a, he's like Paul. He just wants to spend time with God. And so he, he goes up to the mountain. He spends time with God for 40 days. God gives him the Ten Commandments. He's coming down. He hears a lot of noise, a lot of noise. And he's like, Joshua, is that the sound of victory? Joshua's up. I don't think it's the sound of victory. That just sounds like the the sound of deception, right? They come down, what's going on? The people came to Aaron. They said, Aaron, where is this fellow? It's been 40 days. Where is our life group leader? It's been a week. Where is that person that that, that taught me, that talked to me about the gospel? Where is he? What are we going to do? Uh, uh, well, and they started panicking. Where is this fellow Moses? And so they pressured Aaron, make us a God that we will follow. And, Moses, and, and Aaron said, all right, well, throw me your jewelries. And so he just threw it into the fire, and out came a golden calf. 
right? What a coincidence. A, a golden calf comes out, and they're just war- worshiping. They're dancing. This is our God. This is the God that led us out of Egypt, right? This is the God that, that made the exodus possible for us. And Moses comes down, and he's like, are you serious? I can't believe you guys. What's wrong with you? 40 days only. Come on, people. 40 days, pull yourself together. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without food. You can't even go without me for 40 days. What's wrong with you guys, right? What's going on? We have this tendency to go back. We're, we're so pathetic, we have this tendency to, to just go back to our old ways. We're willing to settle for a golden calf and say, yes, this is our deliverance. Yes, this is our exodus. This is, this is our hope right here, this golden calf, this job, this relationship, right? This beautiful country or this beautiful state. Are you kidding me? So you guys, you guys see the correlation in both of these exodus? There is this tendency, there is this danger to forget where we came from. And to begin to compromise for something so much less and pathetic. What do they step into? They stepped into a a, a distorted gospel. Distorted gospel. The, The Jews, the Gentiles, they're all part of this polytheistic society, the Roman society, where they had all kinds of gods they worshipped. I mean, literally you had a god in, in every home, on every street, and on every public square there was a god, there was a temple. Everyone was expected to worship the gods. This was a hyper-spiritual empire, hyper-spiritual. Everyone was, 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 was uh, expected to worship. Whenever there would be a natural disaster, some kind of plague, COVID broke out, Right? What was the response of the society? They would, they would see it as a punishment from the gods. This is judgment from the gods. And so what they would do, they would try to find a scapegoat. Where is it? Where is it? Who's causing this punishment? Who's causing this curse? Who's that person? And they would look for people that didn't have idols, for people that, that weren't devoted to their gods. And they would either stone them or they would, I don't know, they would do something to these guys. Right? There would be, there would be repercussion. There would be a punishment that these people had to pay. But the Jews, the Jews, they, 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 they had an exemption. The Jews, they, they didn't have idols. They didn't worship their gods. The Jews were exempt from all these idols. They were exempt from these consequence, uh, consequences of not having idols. How were they exempt? Well, the pagans, they, they didn't touch the Jews because here's the, about the, here's the thing about Jews. The Jews were, I mean, they were so uh, moral. These guys, they were known for having a lazy day known as the Sabbath, right? They, they, they were known for uh, having crazy uh, uh, food laws. They didn't eat pork. They weren't able to combine, uh, you know, different types of meats together. They were known for following, observing the Torah. And then to top it off, these guys mutilated themselves. They circumcised all the men. And you don't want to mess with people like that. I mean, who cares if they don't got idols? These guys are mutilating themselves. Just leave them alone, right? They, okay, you guys are, whatever. We believe you that you guys uh, have a true God. And so they left them alone. If Gentiles wanted to join uh, the the Judaic belief system, they would have to go through their uh, ABC course, their their belong course, their, their growth track course, right? And here's what they had to do. They had to, number one, get baptized, Number two, they had to uh, uh, get circumcised. All the ma- males had to get circumcised. Three, they had to observe the Torah. And then four, they had to uh, uh, observe the kosher laws, the food laws. And so once that happened, the Jews would say, all right, you're pure, you're holy, you're set apart from all the other Gentiles. You are now welcome into the family of God, the true, true undefiled religion. But when Paul came, he says, he began to preach to the Gentiles. He says, no, you don't have to go through this, bap- uh, through this uh, uh, belong course. You don't have to follow all these different steps. You just have to believe on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so he presented a gospel that, that is enough, right? A gospel of grace through faith. And so uh, Gentiles begin to convert. Jews begin to convert. And so the pagans then would come after a disaster and they would come to the Christians and they would say, hey guys, uh, where's your idols? They're like, no, no, we serve the one true Yahweh. 
And they're like, really? Well, we're going to go to the synagogue and find out. And so they would go to the synagogue. They're like, hey, uh, so-and-so says that they're, they're serving the one true God. Are they with you guys? They're like, no. They never, went through our, uh, uh, they never went through our Grove track. They never went through our membership course. And they're like, hold on. What's going on? Guys, what's going on? And so uh, their defense is, hey, we believe on Jesus. That's it. Paul said that's enough. And so the, 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 the synagogues would not give them the exemption for, that they could present to the Gentiles. And so what happened was the, the synagogue leaders would come to these Christians and say, listen, guys, you guys are willing to die for your faith. We don't really want you to die. But listen, uh, uh, in order for you to have these exemption forms, we need you guys to, to get circumcised. I believe on Jesus. We're not going to touch Jesus, but just add some of these things to your guys' practices. And they, they say, hey, well, that's not what Paul said. Who cares about Paul? Right? Is Paul here? Where's Paul? Has anybody seen Paul? Where's Paul? Right? It's been a couple of months since Paul has been here. These guys are asking for exemption. You want exemption or not? Right? And they would pressure people, and obviously there was more different nuances and different case, cases that were going on, but this is just an idea of how the synagogues were uh, oppressing the, the new Christians. Perhaps the Gentiles were coming saying, guys, listen, uh, you, you guys are just radical. Man, just ease it up a little bit, right? So they were experiencing uh, pressure from both sides, the, Jew, the Jews and the Gentiles, to compromise. And so Paul was not around, and and they began to question, and, and they weren't willing to let go of Jesus. And so they just, they, they begin to add on some things, and they begin to subtract some things from uh, the message that Paul presented to them. And so Paul opens up this letter, and he begins with, what does he begin with? He begins with establishing his own authority. Why? Because he was discredited in the eyes of these Judaic leaders. He was discredited. Who is this Paul? He's a schmuck. He wasn't even one of the original disciples. Uh, this guy just, he's, he's having a midlife crisis. Don't listen to him, right? And so Paul opens up and he says, this is what he says. He says, Paul, me, I'm talking about me, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, right? Me, I'm a messenger. That's what the apostle, the word means. I'm a messenger, not from man nor through man, from Jesus and God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Right? Why is Paul saying that? Because he says, listen, I'm not, my, my credibility does not come from the disciples. My credibility doesn't come from the synagogue. My credibility doesn't even come from what I did or didn't do. It doesn't come from my works. It, doesn't, it comes from the fact that I was sent by Jesus. I was sent by Jesus. The Roman Catholic uh, uh, church teaches that because the Bible authors were church men, because they were church men, the church now has the ability and the authority to interpret the scriptures and to supplement the scriptures because the, the Bible was written by church people. And what Paul's saying, listen, I am not an apostle of the church. The church never sent me, and the church never established me. My authority comes from Jesus. I am the apostle of Jesus. You are not the apostles of, of the church. You're not followers of the church. You are apostles and followers of Jesus Christ. Your authority does not come from me. It does not come from our leadership team. It comes from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Come on, people. Oh, we don't believe in Anthem Church. Who cares? Believe on Jesus, right? And so Paul, he establishes his authority. He says, listen, if, if I'm legit, then the message that I preach is legit, right? If I preach, if I'm legit because I, I, I have been notarized by Christ himself, then my message, what I preach to you is, is legit. And so he begins, to, he, he later, he, the next few verses, he gives us uh, really the foundation. He just uh, gives us a brief rundown of the true gospel of his message, Listen to this. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So he begins with grace and peace. Did you know that Paul uses this word grace and peace over a hundred times in his, in his 13 epistles? I mean, this is what Paul lives and breathes, grace and peace. 
It's all about grace and peace, right? Why grace? Well, grace is, grace is the means, right? Grace is unearned favor. We don't do anything to deserve grace. Grace is the means. But the goal of grace is always peace. We don't just stop at grace. The, the goal is to get to peace. What is peace? The Greek word is shalom. It, it, it's implying harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. It's where we experience all these things in our souls. Why? Because we have been, uh, there has been made peace with God. And now because there's peace with God, we, ha- we have peace here. We can experience shalom the way things ought to be, the Imago Dei. And because we experience this internally now, we can live this out horizontally, right? This is what the gospel is all about. Grace is the means. The goal is peace. How did, how did this happen? How did grace and peace happen to us? Well, he says Jesus gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. He wasn't a victim of a cruel, mean father. No, he gave himself up for us, free willingly. And he didn't do it on his own. This wasn't this autonomous decision that he made. It was the father's will. It was the father's will to give the son for the son to give himself. Then why did Jesus do it? Why did Jesus give himself? Because we could not, we could not find freedom from our own sins. And the Bible says he did it to to, uh, rid us of our sins, to rid us past, present, and future, to wash us, us away from sin, our mistakes, our guilt, our shame. That's why Jesus did it. But, but more than that, he says he did it to deliver us. This is the full gospel. To deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus doesn't just stop at forgiving us and washing us away, uh, ridding us of our sins. No, God's goal is to rid us from this present evil age. This word rid or, or deliver is this idea of someone drowning. A couple of years ago, I was in uh, Hawaii, and all day Ezra was in the pool. Melly was in the pool. They were jumping. They had their life, uh, life jackets. It was lunchtime. We said, guys, come here. They came. We gave them some food, and, and, and we were lazy, so we have kids, right? Hey, Ezra, hey, why don't you go throw this in the bin? Do something, right? Food, food ain't free. And so he goes to the bin. He throws the, food, uh, he throws the, uh, the trash away on his way back not realizing he's not wearing a life jacket because we just had lunch, he just jumps into the pool, this deep end of the pool. And we're about 50 to 60 feet away. We just see the splash, and it hits us. The kid's going to die. And so we, just, we don't see him float up, and so we were booking. My wife, she almost outran me, people. And so uh, just plunge into the, into the pool and I, I, went, I remember just seeing his eyes. He had these help. He couldn't believe what was going on. He could not help himself. He could not help himself. He needed somebody to pull him out. And so I jumped in and I grabbed him and just tossed him out. The kid was just, I mean, he's bewildered. He was just, he was shocked. He was fearful for his life. He was about to lose his life. He did not know what was happening to him, friends. And this is the gospel. We were drowning in sin. We were drowning in this present evil age. We were in the world and of the world. We were no better than the world. We were actually far worse than we even think we were. We could not help ourselves. There was nothing. We we could not push ourselves. We could not use the ledge. There was nothing. There was no ladder for us to climb up. There was absolutely no way for us to get out of this pool of this world. It had such a grip. There was no hope for us. And Jesus Christ came to rescue us, to pull us, not just once, but for all. So we could be in the world, but not of the world. Right? So we could be liberated from legalism. We could be liberated from from, uh, rebellion. We could be liberated from the self-centeredness life where we want to be God and we we want to become like God, but just on our own terms in the tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of life which is grace and peace. So God rescues us. Friends, the only way to find this freedom from this pool of sin is to believe on the gospel. 
To believe that Jesus is enough, to believe that it is finished, to believe that everything that he says is true. Why? Because he proved it by his resurrection. Jesus is more ultimate than anything else in life, death itself. And so he is trustworthy. His way is the only way. And so when you begin to believe on that, God begins to liberate us from this pool for this evil age. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. There is no way you can resist this world apart from me. Apart from Jesus, there is no social justice. I don't care who you are. There is no social justice apart from Jesus Christ. Apart from the gospel, there is no social justice. And so that's why Paul says, I can't believe you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ. The other reason Paul is so astonished is because they're not just forsaken a theology. They're not forsaken a denomination. They're forsaken the person of Jesus. They're forsaken God. They're forsaken shalom. They're forsaken the creator of life. They're forsaken the one person that can actually satisfy that deep longing in their soul. They're forsaking him. Friends, whenever we walk away from the gospel, we are walking away from Christ. We're walking away from God. And so, what are they walking into? What is the distorted gospel? What does it look like? Well, there's two ways we can distort their gospel. There's only two ways. Number one, it's when we add to the gospel. Number two, it's when we subtract from the gospel. So here are some ways that we can add to the gospel. Jesus plus circumcision was their case. Jesus plus food laws. Jesus plus no tattoos. Jesus plus no drinking. Jesus plus uh, 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 showing up uh, every single Sunday to church, right? Jesus plus performance. Jesus plus, if you're not speaking in tongues, are you even saved? Right? Jesus plus spiritual gifts. Jesus plus morality. Jesus plus you got to be a good person and you got to work hard and you better not slip up and you better not mess up. Jesus plus. Jesus plus social work. If you're not feeding the poor, are you even saved? See, the danger with adding to the gospel adding this element of performance to the gospel, here's here's the danger of it. You're gonna have two types of days. One day is gonna be uh, one of those days where you wake up in the morning, man, it's sunshine, it's Sunday, you read your Bible, you feed the kids, you never, you don't lose it, you you keep your cool with the kids, right? You keep your cool with your spouse, you even make her some coffee, make, make him some breakfast, compliment, open the door, show up to church, Say a few hallelujahs, a few amens. Maybe even raise your hands for a little worship. Not too high, just enough. Right? Maybe even do a one-time gift. Invite somebody over to your house. Wave to a homeless person on your way home. Show up home and you're just like, ah, man. God, you love me. Just such a, man, I had a great day today, God. Aren't you proud of me? Man, I killed it today. What a sermon. What a series. Three services, 700 people. That's awesome. Jeez, God. If you can have a few more disciples like me, I just can't. Man, we would crush this thing. Right? And so what happens is you, God is not glorified. God's not glorified because part of the gospel is God is for God. He did it on his own without our efforts so that he could get all the glory and all the honor forever and ever and ever and ever, amen. And you and me would never even get a glimpse of it. All glory goes to God. And the only glory that we get is the leftovers from God, which is more than enough, right? But on a bad day, right, you you woke up, you you stayed up too late, you, you, you were binge watching a new Netflix film and you woke up and you didn't have time to pray and you showed up to work and man, you just cussed everybody out because they're not doing their job, but you're doing your job. And uh, on your way home, you're just cutting people off. Hey, you got a little sick, so you didn't, you didn't feel like going to church, so you didn't go to church. You maybe, maybe took, took some time off from serving at the local church, took some time off from, from giving because tax season, right? And so you show up home and you're just like, 
You're not talking to God because you know that you just didn't perform. God does not, God is not approving you. You're, you're, you're not good enough for God, right? And so you just avoid God. You just avoid him. And so what happens is God becomes not your savior, but God either becomes some kind of coach, some kind of teacher, some kind of guru that has good advice for you, or God becomes this cruel, mean boss that just has his heavy hammer on you. Perform, perform. You're lazy. You're lazy. Prove it. Prove it that you believe in Jesus Christ. Do it. Do it harder. Work. Work. Show up. Don't. You better pray on your knees. Pray. You pray in such a way where it hurts, right? And so you have this distorted vision of Christ the Savior. And then subtracting. Subtracting is the other way the gospel is distorted. Where Jesus, the gospel is, is only presented in this very positive, like, hey, God loves you, man. God's been seeing how you've been trying to, you know, pursue this certain life, man, the American dream. Listen, God can fulfill that for you. He'll give you the spouse that you want. He'll give you the car that you want. Man, he'll, he'll give you the health that you want. He'll give you the body. That you, God will do that for you. All you have to do is just raise your hand. And, and I know it's kind of awkward, so why don't we all just close our eyes? Right, because we're so prideful. We can't admit that in front of people that we need some help from God. And so let's just close our eyes so God can give us the life that we really, really want. So God can fulfill it. And so, and so we raise up our hands. And we're like, yeah, thank you, Jesus. I can't wait for that breakthrough, that promo coming. Right? And what's missing in this gospel? The dead Jesus that was on the cross because of our heinous nature, our sin, our rebellion, us squandering all of the wealth that God gave us, the Imago Dei, squandering, and Jesus Christ dying on the cross because that sin was so heinous. And on the third day, Jesus resurrected, why? Because he was the only innocent man, and God had to vindicate his death, and God did vindicate his death. What else is missing? We need to die now to ourselves and follow this Jesus. We need to repent. We need to acknowledge that we are bad lords. We're bad leaders. We need a God. What else is missing? Discipleship, the way of Jesus. What else is missing? Offering our bodies as living sacrifice. What else is missing? Seeking first the kingdom of God. Everything else is added on to. What else is missing? The, the the radical gospel hospitality, right? That's what's missing in this gospel. This convenient gospel, this cheap gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has this amazing quote that I posted on all of our Telegram pages in our church. Join those pages if you want that quote. But it's just the cheap gospel is distorted gospel. And how did they get? How did it get here? How do you get to a place where you take away and you add? How do you get there? Well, you got people. You got people that did not believe on the gospel that Paul was preaching. And they're not just going to sit around and let Paul continue spreading this heresy. What, they're going around, they're poisoning people. The Bible says they're troubling people. They're, why troubling? Because they're bringing damnation on their soul. They're bringing down. Why are they doing that? Because the Bible says that they, are, they haven't been set free from the evil age. Because they did not believe in the gospel, they have not been set free from the evil age. And so, because they're not set free, they're asking you to compromise too. They're asking for you to join in their debauchery. They're asking you to join in their compromise. And Paul says, you know what? These guys, they never come and they say, hey guys, the lifestyle that I'm living and the message that I'm preaching is serious. No, no, they don't do that. They say, no, no, look, this is what Jesus would want you to do. They present themselves as authentic and legit. They never say, hey, don't follow. No, no, they say, follow us, guys. This is truly the way Jesus wants you to live. And so people fall for it. People go on. Right now we have all kinds of preachers on social media, right? And, we, and for us, as long as they have the blue check mark, hey, these guys must be trustworthy, right? They're, man, their messages, did you see their graphics, their videos? Dude, the recap videos, the little slogans that they're using, this gospel is legit, right? And so we follow them. And Paul says, listen, I don't care if they're the Pope. I don't care if it's uh, uh, Michael uh, or, or Gabriel. I don't care if it's an angel. Paul says, listen, even if I come crawling back in after my second stoning and say, guys, listen, 
this gospel that Jesus uh, uh, told me to preach, listen, it's just hard. We need to do a 2.0. We gotta, we gotta soften this thing up because I don't think we're all gonna, I don't think we're gonna reach retirement if we keep preaching like this. And so imagine if, Paul says, if I even show up and I persuade you and I beg you on my knees, guys, let's just tone it down. He says, don't listen to me. Do not listen to me because I have been deceived myself. And so Paul says, how, how do you filter? How do you, how do you gauge if it's legit or not? The gospel that I originally preached to you, go back to Galatians cha- chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 5. Read it over. Let it resonate with you. Let it marinate in your mind. Let it penetrate every bean of your body and never walk from it. Stay in this way. This is the way. Walk in it. Walk in it. Read the gospels of, of the four gospels. Study the epistles. Never walk from the scripture. Know the word. Be in the word. Renew your mind with the word. And Paul says, listen, if these guys come, I know I'm a little late here. If these guys come, he says, let them be accursed. He says it two times, let them be accursed. Meaning let them be uh, banned from from God. Let them be damned for eternity. He doesn't want that for them, but he says "That's, that's how bad this thing is. Hypocrisy, this false distorting God, that's how bad it is. Right? And our response is, and the response of these guys are like, Paul, pull yourself together. What you're saying is crazy, man. That's not acceptable. Not in our day and age. Not in the day of tolerance, right? Paul, you're going to, that's, that's really mean. That's really mean. That's rude, Paul. And I love what John Stott says. Listen to what he says. This is our cultural climate. He says, we live in an age in which it is considered very narrow-minded and intolerant to have any clear and strong opinion of one's own, just in general, right? Let alone to disagree sharply with anybody else. As for, as for actually desiring false teachers to fall under the curse of God and to be treated as such by the church, the very idea is too inconceivable. But I venture to say that if we cared more for the glory of Christ and for the good of the soul of man, we too would, be not, uh, we too would not be able to bear the corruption of the gospel. He says if we actually care about the glory of God and we actually care about the salvation of souls, man, we would, we would not even have think twice to accurse people. We'd not take, think twice to call false preachers out. Why? Because God's glory is in jeopardy. And man's eternal salvation is in jeopardy. I, I got called out a couple times. Hey, Alex, hey, cool it, man. Just because they're not part of our church, just because they don't do things the way we do, take it easy on them, right? You're being a little harsh. If they take away or add to the gospel to distort it, to take the glory from God, let them be accursed. Let everybody know. You do a YouTube, you do an Instagram, you do a Twitter, whatever platform you use, man, and you go live stream and you say, guys, listen, with all due respect, and you use scripture, don't use your opinion. You use scripture and you say, guys, listen, their lifestyle, their preaching is not in line with the apostles' teaching, the teaching of Jesus Christ. I don't care if they call themselves disciples. I don't care if they have a, a super new, brand new revelation. If it's not old, reject it. If it's not eternal, reject it. Let me close with this. And I, and I did, did go over, so I might as well just go over some more, right? Friends, the pressure's real, right? Pressure's real to capitulate to our culture, to just live our lives for ourselves, to just do everything about us, do everything about our reputation, do everything for comfort and safety. The pressure's real. The pressure is real to, to compromise the gospel. The pressure is real, right, to perform, to, 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 to work out by ourselves. Our, it's real, right? And so this is why Paul, he closes the way he does. He says, for, if, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Different translation says, if I was still trying to please man, I would not be fit for the gospel. Here's what Paul's saying. Listen, if you truly have let the gospel grip you, here's what it's going to do. You're, you're, you're not going to be a pleaser of man anymore. 
you're not going to even flinch. You won't blink when somebody comes and they try to put pressure on you and they try to persecute you and they try to get you to bend. You will not flinch. Do you know why? Because you have the same thing ringing in your ears that rang in the ears of Jesus when he was being baptized. You are my son. With I love you and with you I am well pleased. That's what the gospel offers. You are my son. I love you, and I'm pleased with you. You don't have to do anything else. I'm pleased with you. That's it. It is finished. You are uh, pleased by God. That ache is satisfied. And so when that ache is satisfied, man, you are able to stick to the truth. You are able to live out the gospel. You're able to do it. Now, some of you guys are confused. You're like, hey, so are we supposed to work or not work? Well, Dallas Willard says, Uh, uh, grace is not opposed to works it's opposed to earnings right we don't work so that we can earn our status with God our approval no no we work because we have been set free and now we are demonstrating the nature of God we're living out the rule and reign of God as if he was here now with us well the gospel is just for new believers right it's for the unchurched why, why, I mean, why aren't we talking about spiritual gifts? Why aren't we talking about eschatology? Let's talk about some heavier stuff, man. Give us some heavy topics to go through. No, no. He is writing to the churches of Galatia. He is writing to the Christians. Do you know why? Because familiarity breeds contempt. The longer you're around the gospel, the longer you're around the risen Christ, you get so familiar with it, and you start to grow contempt towards it. It no longer moves you. It no longer galvanizes you the way it ought to. And so listen to what Timothy Keller says. He says, in our Christian life, we never get beyond the gospel to to something more advanced. The gospel is not the first step in our stairway of truths. Rather, it is more like the hub in a wheel of truth. The gospel is not just the ABCs, but the A to Z of Christianity. The gospel is not the minimum requirement doctrine necessary to enter the kingdom of God, but the way we make all progress in the kingdom. The gospel, what is he saying? The gospel doesn't just save us. The gospel sustains us. It sustains us. It doesn't just save. It keeps us. It keeps us from the pool of rebellion and religion. The gospel. And so, my friends, we should be in the gospel daily. Amen? We got 13 more weeks. If you guys want to stand on your feet, let's pray. We're going to skip on the band kind of went too long Father we just thank you Lord we thank you for the gospel we thank you for what, 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 you, what you accomplished 2,000 years ago and not just for us for my children for, for all of us here today for my neighbors for my enemies for all of us God religious, rebellious old or younger son God all of us thank you Jesus God, today we give you all the glory and all the honor. Father, would you forgive us if we, if we allowed ourselves to sink into a distorted gospel, if we allowed ourselves to follow a gospel that's more convenient and that is more uh, safer. Father, would you forgive us if, if we allowed ourselves to get into a place of re- re- religiousness, religiosity, God, where we, we're, we're earning our salvation versus dwelling in it, Father, forgive us. Lord, today we just want to give all glory to you. We pray that Anthem Church would be a church that is is basking in the truths of the gospel and living out the gospel, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, if there's anyone here in this room that has not accepted the gospel, has not believed on you, Father, would you give them the greatest gift, the gift of salvation? Would they call on your name today and just simply trust that you are enough? Lord, I pray and just put all their hope and trust in you and and join the journey of discipleship. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, help us. Help us, Father, to preserve the true gospel. Not just preserve it, Father, but proclaim it to establish churches, make disciples of all nations, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. If you guys want to just come up to one of our leaders, someone, and just talk, ask some questions, get prayed over, Uh, give your life to the Lord. Feel free to do that. If not, God bless you guys. Enjoy some coffee. Enjoy the sun. Today's a